Hello, welcome, and thank you for tuning in to this morning's panel as part of the Word on the Street Toronto 2021 Festival, our 32nd annual festival and our second fully virtual. I'm Sienna, your host, and we are excited to be presenting In Conversation with Kamal al Salele and Tamash Dubozi, an in-depth conversation of their newest books, Return, Why We Go Back to Where We Come, and Ghost Geographies, Fictions, exploring culture and environment in partnership with Diaspora Dialogues. Before we dive into our discussion, we need to recognize the land that we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with a final claim settlement in 2010. Watts Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Tkaranto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples with long histories on this land, and acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honors these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land that you occupy, wherever it is that you're tuning in from. We have just a few announcements before we introduce today's amazing panelists. I mentioned off the top that this is the second virtual Word on the Street Festival in our 32 year history, but that's not strictly true because this year's celebration also includes four days of in-person author signings at local bookstores starting today. We'll be at Baca Phoenix Books on Saturday and another story bookshop on Sunday. Check out our website or our Instagram Reels page to see the signing schedule for both shops. And don't forget to sign up for our upcoming panels. This is day two of our 10-day festival, celebrating storytelling, ideas, and imagination. Later today, we'll be joined by Jem Hall, Selena Golding, Shira Spector, and Sami Alwani for our panel, Illustrating Identity, Visual Language and Queer Stories, at 1 p.m. Following that at three, we have Illustrating History, Indigenous History Stories Past and Present, which is a discussion with Gord Hill, Katharina Vermet, and Molly Swain. All information about our upcoming panels can be found on our website at toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you want to be the first to know about new videos from The Word on the Street Toronto, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all the panels from this year's festival. And if you enjoyed today's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. Now, I am pleased as punch to welcome our moderator for this panel, TLM. Taylor is the author of the Giller shortlisted An Ocean of Minutes, which has been translated into three languages and optioned for television. And her short form writing has been published in Granta, The Nation, The Paris Review, Best Canadian Stories, The Globe and Mail, Guernica, and others. She lives in Toronto, where she wears many hats as a book critic, as a creative writing faculty, and as mother to many small creatures. Hello, Taya. It's a pleasure to have you here this morning. Hi, Sienna. Thank you much, so much for having us. And of course. Well, I'm going to hand it off to you, and I hope you have a wonderful discussion with our panelists. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to jump right in uh, and introduce our first speaker, who is Kamal al Salehli. He is the author of the bestseller Intolerable, a memoir of extremes, winner of the 2013 Toronto Book Award and finalist for CBC's Canada Reads and the Hillary Weston Writers Trust Prize for Nonfiction. His second book, Brown, What Being Brown in the World Today Means to Everyone, won the Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for Political Writing and was a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Awards for Nonfiction. And he's also so, a two-time nominee for the National Magazine Awards, winning a gold medal in 2019 for Collins. He holds a PhD in English and is a professor at Ryerson University School of Journalism. And he's going to read to us uh, from his new book, Return, Why We, Why we Go Back to Where We Come From. Thank you so much, Taya. Uh, I, I obviously sent that bio before I moved to UBC, where I, ju I just got a new job at UBC. So I'm, I'm hello everyone, I miss Toronto. I just want to start on that note. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in Vancouver, it's been raining for two days. Anyway. So I'm gonna read just from the first couple of pages uh, of the book. Where do you want to be buried? Since my date and I were walking alongside Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Midtown Toronto, the question didn't come as a complete surprise. Its morbidity threw me off nonetheless. I had planned this to be a romantic post-dinner summer stroll. My dream list of questions included, but was not limited to, do you, do you want to move in together? 
and where would you like to go for our honeymoon? He and I had just braved the crowds at a nearby ice cream shop and devoured double servings of pistachio and chocolate gelato in a scene worthy of, rom -com, of a rom-com. Toronto, I replied. Although I was born in Yemen, raised in Lebanon and Egypt, and educated in England, I had come to see Toronto and Canada as my homeland. I reveled in the kindness the city had shown me and the career opportunities it had afforded me. I dedicated my first book to it for giving me what I had been looking for, a home. In my second, I called it my sanctuary, a good place to be brown. My love affair with Toronto started the moment I landed at its international airport on April 20th, 1996. Like the immigrants have left oppressive regimes, I think of that arrival date as the second birthday, a, par a parallel timeline in which life began just as I was about to turn 32. I no longer entertained thoughts of a secret unled life because I finally had the one I wanted. I want to be buried in Sana'a next to my grandparents, countered my date, who was born near Detroit to a Yemeni family and had spent most of his adult life in the United States. Although he was a natural born citizen, he didn't think that America deserved his remains because he'd never felt connected to it as a country of birth or of residence. I remember thinking how, how fortunate I was to claim a dot on the world map as mine one place for my body to play, love, work, grow old, and when the time came, to be put to rest. My dates were words su suggested that inner turmoil and an unbelonging to which I was immune. Skipping just one, one, uh, one paragraph. If I were asked the same question today, almost a decade later, I wouldn't know how to respond. I, su I suspect I wouldn't be as definitive about Toronto as I once was. My date's remark, which seemed irrational and troubling then, strikes me now as reasonable and in a way prescient. Our relationship has ended, but the question lingers. Thank you. Uh, Taya, you're muted. Taya, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to introduce our next panelist uh, with sound this time. Uh, Tomasz Dabozzi is a professor in the Department of English and Film Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. He lives in Kitchener, Ontario, Canada. He has published four books of short fiction, uh, When X Equals Mary Lou, Last Notes and Other Stories, Siege 13 Stories, and Five Mishaps, and a fifth collection, Ghost Geographies Fictions, is due in the fall of 2021, which is now. Um, Siege 13 won the 2012 Rogers, R Rogers Writers Trust of Canada Fiction Prize and was shortlisted for both the Governor General's Award for Fiction and the 2013 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award. He has published over 70 short stories in journals such as One Story, Fiction, Agni and Granta, and won an O. Henry Prize in 2011 and the Gold Medal for Fiction at the National Magazine Awards in 2014. His scholarly work on music, utopianism, American literature, the short story, and post-structuralism have appeared in journals such as Canadian Literature, Genre, the Canadian Review of American Studies, Mosaic, and Modern Fiction Studies, among others. He has also published numerous chapters in peer-reviewed anthologies published by Rutledge, the University of Nebraska Press, the University of South Carolina Press, and Wilfrid Laurier University Press, among others. Um, and he's here today to read an excerpt from Ghost Geographies. Okay, thanks, Taya. Um, okay, I'm hoping my ancient um, iPad's going to uh, survive this moment. Uh, so I'm reading a short excerpt from a story called Spires, which is um, about a Hungarian woman who um, emigrates with her husband to a very, very small town on the uh, west coast of Canada, uh, a small logging town. Uh, population um, 
13,000 or so <laughs> and uh, modeled on, uh, on uh, Powell River, which is my hometown. So this story is called Spires and the woman's uh, name is Marish and the, um, her husband's name is Paul. And uh, this is just, they have two children. So this is just a short excerpt from her situation there in that town, having emigrated from Budapest, which is a city of 2 million to, um, to this very small town. I was drinking a beer and listening to Leo Viner. The groceries were still on the kitchen table where she'd left them. Clara and Tommy sat sleepy eyed in the kitchen, watching a mouse edge closer to a trap behind the fridge. Clara was aiming her slingshot loaded with a marble, and there were already a few dents in the side of the refrigerator. Maris stared at them a minute, then began pulling cans from the shopping bags. She cleared the table, set them down. Here was Buddha Castle. That fold in the embroidered tablecloth was the Danube. Here was Matyash Templum, big can, big can, little can. Watch the spires rise, she said, Clara and Tommy edging closer to the table. Here's the Lanshid, Ma Marish said, lining up a series of matchboxes across the Danube, more cans. And then she'd build the, built the white towers, fine as fish bones of the parliament buildings. Then St. Stephen's Basilica, the Academy of Sciences. The kids were helping now, fishing cans out of the cupboards, carrying them to her. Marish then went on to describe the city as if they were walking through it. She told them the story of the architecture, how the stone set aside for the parliament was stolen, and the one the architects replaced it with was softer, more porous, sponging the grime of pollution from the air. Paul looked in on them and smiled, the music soft in the background. Clara was lost in the streets. She didn't even notice him. It's time for the children's bath, he finally said. The haze across her eyes faded. Maris, Marish stepped straight out of the city. It seemed to come with her, trailing behind in a series of fading images, as if she was as quickly stepping into a frame as leaving it behind. She nodded at Paul as if she didn't know who he was. The children followed her, traipsing up Andrashi Boulevard through Hero Square, straight to the entrance of the Seicheni Fude, stream rising off the waters. Every day after that, she walked them along the streets of the capital, Tommy always wanted to go to the Nemzeti Museum and see the crown with its tilted crucifix. Marish peered between the pillars of split pea and cream of broccoli soup and described what they saw in the glass cases of the exhibits. Coats of arms, chain mail, swords unearthed at Mohach, the shifting borders of the kingdom. Clara wanted to stand spinning beneath the secessionist motifs of the Ipar Muveseti Museum, ceilings of ceramic tile, all flowers and arabesques. Mother and children, they walked through the old city for miles. In fact, they never left. In the forest near the house, they were on the Kishkarut. Farther away, it was the Najkarut. Marish carefully corrected the children as they crossed the streets. Sentished van Teres, Erge, Bet, Yosef, Ferenc. The old logging road met with the abandoned spur, met with the new way to the dryland sort, met with the long driveway to the towed away house, met with the gravel track that led home again. They circled around and around, stopping at famous places along the way. The West Station, the Comedy Theater, Hotel Royal, the New York Cafe, the Twin Towers of the Yosef Varush Church, the Octagon, Botkani Palace. They dined with artists and faded aristocracy and the apparatchiks whose evil Marish taught them to recognize on sight. Letters arrived for Marish's mother, filled with news of the family, the events less important to Marish than where they took place. She closed her eyes and imagined taking the Have to Gödöllő. She thought of the seven hills of Vesprem. She could see the waters of Lake Balaton, iridescent green, from the dry forests of Balaton Almadi. She could smell the waves on the breeze. The children started calling Stillwater Budapest. Stay with, us, stay with us in Budapest, they said to Paul the next Saturday as he got into the truck. He looked at Marish, then squatted to speak with the kids. I have to go to work today, he said, just until lunchtime, then I'll be home, and all day tomorrow. He looked back at Marish, who was holding out the hem of her dress and swaying slightly, like a young girl hearing a waltz for the first time. We're going for a walk to the castle today, said Tommy. We're going to look out from the Hollas Bastia, said Clara. I'll be back in time for lunch, said Paul, frowning. He finally caught Marish's eye. She smiled and whispered to him to come back soon. She told him he should stay. She said whenever he came back was okay.
Um, so thank you to Kamal and Tamash for those really poignant readings. Um, so I wanted to begin our conversation today by asking a question about beginnings. Uh, a funny coincidence is that both your books um, start with an emphasis on being humbled. Um, so in that section, actually, that we just heard Kamal read, you know, you recant that earlier idea that you had that returns are a form of defeat or weakness. Mm -hmm. um, and Ghost Geographies opens with an epigraph from Hegel, um, of which I will read a shortened version. It says, often an individual imagines himself, his high ideals, the glorious deeds he means to carry out as serving the betterment of the world. These ideas must be left behind. Uh, people too often forget how hilarious Hegel is, I, I think. <laughs> so he both commends with this kind of appeal to modesty, uh, but writing, especially in these two books, um, which gather modes from wide and vast territories into a single place, the kind of writing you're doing is actually an act of great daring and ambition. So I wanted uh, to know why you both wanted to start from a place of humility, whether in methodology or in mood. Well, Tomas, you should go first on that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Uh, well, though, I picked the quote from Hegel because so many of my stories deal with uh, precisely the, uh, the the traps and snares and uh, and um, uh, failure of ambition, mm -hmm. in, in especially in a political sense. So, um, you know, the idea that somehow my actions are are uh, worthwhile enough for everyone to notice and pay attention to because I'm changing the world was sort of the, the hubris that I was taking on in a little bit in some of the stories. And then other stories, I was dealing with precisely those figures who aren't recognized by history or mm -hmm. official historical records who are lost in the margins and to the importance of paying attention to their work so that the epigraph kind of works for me in, in both both senses, um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, so that that was sort of where where I was taking off from in terms of of, of the stories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And did um, did that uh, pattern to do with the importance of humility, or sometimes the unfortunate nature of uh, the way that people are overlooked? Was that something that you started out wanting to write about, or was it just something that sort of arose the more that you worked on these stories? Yeah, it probably the second the yeah. second thing you said, uh, the latter. It, yeah, it, it's the patterns always tend to emerge after, never before. Yeah, and the Hegel quote I came to pretty much when all the work was already done. Um, so uh, it's not as though I had the quote and then started from there, it was <laughs> actually the reverse. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, I, I think is usually how it is. And, and I often find it uh, em embarrassing actually when I realize that there's a pattern <laughs> to, yeah. to work because you're like, oh, I obviously have a fixation. <laughs> yeah, something's happening here. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, it can be misleading because the Hegel quotes at the beginning, I'm, I'm just waiting for the person to say, oh, you know, he wrote this book uh, uh, starting with this quote from Hegel. That's why it's so stiff and artificial. Oh, um, no. You know, that's what I'm. That's what I'm kind of waiting for for a review or something to say this. But uh, no, uh, I found it much later. No, you will not hear that, that from me. Yeah, <laughs> we established that Hegel is hilarious. So that's, that's yeah. Uh, so yeah, he's funny. Yeah, yeah. 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 rebranding Re Hegel. <laughs> um, 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 and what about you, Kamal? Well, I, 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 I think my starting point was 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 a lot more personal uh, in the sense that I, I just feel that my my relationship with Toronto and Canada has changed mm -hmm. uh, over the years. And on some level, the first book was a love letter to Toronto, which I still do because now that I've been away from it for almost three weeks, I, I miss it terribly. Um, but I kind of wanted to, it, it's just, I feel like my affinity to it has been recalibrated a little bit. I'm much more critical um, of... Um, of, of the city that I that I called home uh, than I was even six, seven years ago. And I think a lot of that has to do with Trumpism, with the rise of, um, of sort of uh, a very racially motivated hate politics. Um, and I just felt that um, I, I needed to sort of re-examine this idea that going, going home would be a sign of defeat or a sign of giving up. Um, and just give it, give myself and others who think about going home more agency and more of a say in how we uh, shape our lives and that, mm -hmm. that, that migration 
does not need to be a one-way um, ticket, like on a one-way ticket, that people migrate and go home and come back and move a lot. And there's a lot more to these movements than uh, the West is the savior. The third world where I come from is this place that you need to escape from, which was the, really the narrative of my first book. So in, in one way, this book sort of rewrites the, the, the younger me 10 years ago who wrote that first book. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about that first book now um, that you're sort of working in, in the other direction? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, as I think it's quite common for a lot of people to feel uh, that their first book was, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, I, I don't want to say embarrassed or anything, but it, 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 it is the book I had in me at the time. Yeah. It mm -hmm. actually honestly reflected my relationship with Toronto and with Canada. And mm -hmm. it's, it's true to who I was back then, but it may not be true to who I am right now. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the remarkable thing for me is how the change happened so quickly. Um, in a matter of years, not decades. Yeah, yeah. And I think part of the spirit of return is being open to um, allowing things to change in a way, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. being open to recognizing that things are more complicated than uh, certain other ways of thinking about, about life right. uh, may allow for yeah. itself. Yeah. Right. You sound yeah. like my ex who you always used to call me. I used to have a linear way of thinking and, <laughs> and now I have a more lateral yeah. way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know, I think that's really, there's something really neat, I think, about readers being, uh, you know, allowed in to see that transition in someone's thinking. Yeah. Um, so I had a question, I guess this is another question about refusing uh, simplicity, maybe. I wanted to ask you both uh, what genre you think of yourself as writing in. Um, Kamal, I, I would say that, that mo most, if not all of your writing sort of refuses both the categories of journalism, because you draw so boldly and unabashedly from the personal, uh, but also memoir, because you use so much research, there's synthesis, there's direct argument, which makes us think, if not of journalism, even of social science. Um, and Tomas, I think you're doing something similar, but in a totally different way, in that there are sections of ghost geography that read um, kind of like a history book, uh, but maybe like written by a mutineer or something like that. And I'm going to read <laughs> a little excerpt. Um, during his time with ABO from the late 1940s to the early 50s, Zabrowski was the go-to guy for disciplinary efficacy, a term that covered an excruciatingly wide range of activities. But with Stalin's death and the revolution of 1956 and the subsequent attempt by Kadar to put a friendlier face on iron-fisted totalitarianism, he fell from grace. So what I found very delightful about this is that you can imagine a student diligently reading, okay, subsequent attempts by Kadar to put a friendlier face on iron-fisted totalitarianism. <laughs> yep, gotcha. And then being like, what? <laughs> a friendlier <laughs> face? Um, and that happens again and again. We're kind of lulled into thinking we're reading one thing, and then you have these very slight but clever language choices that make the whole thing kind of wobble. So I was wondering for both of you, not just what genre you both align yourself with, because actually, uh, if you think of generic categories, there's so few of them <laughs> that it sort of narrows the conversation to ask you what genre you identify with. But maybe even what works are you in conversation with that help you figure out where your books sit on the spectrum of literature? Mm -hmm. um, should I just should I go first this time? <laughs> um, Please. Um, I, I, I think I, I find there is a kind of a false dichotomy in Canadian, particularly in Canadian literature between memoir and uh, works of, of nonfiction that are mm -hmm. like ideas based or reporting based. And, and what I'm trying to do is find a hybrid that works for me because there would never be a time in which I would write a whole book in that objective third person academic way as if I have you know, these people over there do this and these people do and this and, and I have um, like, and I'm not, I'm not in, there would never be a time, and I, but I also would not write a memoir again. Hmm. Um, so I, I, I like to think, and I may be flattering myself here, that I have, I have found for myself something that straddles both in a way that, that, that I, I'm, the book is steeped in subjectivity in my story. But from that, I use that as a kind of um, a lens or a, th a through line to look at, in this case, six different countries and six different communities or seven different communities. Um, and and, and, and I, I like to think that my story is richer for having lived next to these stories. And, and theirs illustrate mine as well. And, and, and I, I mean, I'm in conversation with the kids that I interview. I am, I am like, the subjectivity is so strong that I'm asking the questions that I wanna hear. 
an answer to um, on many levels. So, so that is that that is the kind, and I find that um, I find that uh, a, a number of books um, more recently. I mean, the, the the kind of writers who I um, uh, I've always been engaging with um, uh, would be people like Tess Gresco and Marcello De Sintio, uh, people who have combined um, their their sort of strong beliefs with also with strong reporting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And do you find that you see that more outside of Canada than inside, or or do you feel like that's happening? All over the place. Um, I think it's happening a, a lot more. I mean, particularly in the UK. I mean, it's remarkable mm -hmm. how how many books in the UK are written with that sort of from a you know very subjective point of view. But look at race politics in the UK. Um, uh, but what what I find in Canada, I think I think I'm actually quoted in a story in the Global Mail today um, that we are still we are still sort of um, like memoir versus um, reported nonfiction, and I think yeah. there, mm -hmm. I, I, and, and I have to say there is a need to support reported nonfiction because it's expensive, mm -hmm. and a lot of writers cannot afford to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean that it comes at the expense of the rise. I mean, I think the headline of the Globe today is the rise and rise of memoir, which mm -hmm. is I also think it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've often been struck uh, by how within the Canadian context, we don't have um, the widest knowledge of creative nonfiction, which is a, a very probably the most cutting edge genre that, that is sort of um, <clears throat> in operation today and how complex that genre is. So that's mm -hmm. definitely um, whenever I'm in the classroom, something that I try to impress upon the writers I'm speaking with. Uh, and uh, and I, I admire that project, Kamal. <laughs> so trying to push those boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Tomash? Um, yeah, I I, uh, I can't help but agree. I think I think part of the problem, at least for me, is is you're as a creative writer or or an artist for you know if I'm I'm getting a, a bit pretentious I suppose, but is is battling against the marketing categories of, of the publishers mm -hmm. right they want to know are you a novelist are you a short story writer are you writing memoir are you writing nonfiction? what are you what are you writing how can we how can we market you so on one hand you're kind of up against that apparatus where you have to um, um, identify yourself in some way and then mm -hmm. you're as it actually as a working writer you're completely on the other side because the whole point of, of writing is to push the boundaries of these genres. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're just repeating what's been done in the past, there's really not a whole lot of, of, of fun in it, really. And there's really not a lot of point in it because the, the, the formal uh, uh, aspects of your writing are as meaningful as the actual content of that writing, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's all part of the, of what it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, so for me, um, uh, the idea of importing elements of nonfiction and importing elements of, of even reportage uh, are, are a really uh, enlivening part of what I'm doing because it gives me access to tools that, that traditionally you may not, I would not have had access to. And I suppose for 10, 15 years now, one of my big frustrations has been trying to escape um, that sort of really impersonal, objective, third-person, 19th-century voice of the omniscient narrator mm -hmm. without falling into um, um, autofiction. Uh, I've, I've no interest in writing autofiction, but I do have a real interest in disposing the reader towards the third-person voice in a way that they don't automatically think they're getting God's point of view. Mm -hmm. so, so that challenge um and and you find it, it it's it's very in journalism it's great because when i read a third person article in the new york times i don't think i'm getting something from an all-knowing all-seeing i know that i'm getting a, a perspective mm -hmm. and yet nowhere in that article does the does the writer tell me what they had for lunch that day <laughs> you know they, they don't need to do that because because it's assumed that this is a pinhole view on a particular event and that and that there will undoubtedly be more to it or there may even be things in it that are simply incorrect and they will be clarified later on. At least that's how I read journalism. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I, I'm guessing a lot of other people don't. Um, but, I, but I've always been attracted to how can I get that into fiction? Mm -hmm. How do I get, how do I make that happen? 
And so that excerpt you read is a, is a perfect example. If you can adjust your language in certain ways, that sensibility comes across and the readers put on guard and they go, oh, wait a minute. I'm not getting God's point of view. I'm getting a point of view of a writer about mm -hmm. these events. Mm -hmm. So you can use language to, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's just part of a larger project that we should be always on guard. Uh, in regards to what we read, that just mm -hmm. because something's coming at us from a particular genre doesn't necessarily automatically make it more believable or less believable yes. than something from fiction. You know, yeah. we always yeah. have to be on guard. Yeah. So that's, mm -hmm. it's part of that sort of larger uh, thing that I'm trying to work through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, and, and I think that totally makes sense. And I, and I think what those sort of subtle inflections do in your book really do uh, make us think about having a critical eye towards the voice, I think. So I think that that was very successful in your work. Um, and it reminds me, I was speaking to Rahman Alam um, a few weeks ago, and it reminds me of something he said about his novel, Leave the World Behind, which actually does have an omniscient voice, um, but does kind of similar things. It's a weird omniscient voice. Um, and he was saying that the way he came up with the voice was he thought about the way that he read stories to his children. And I really loved oh, that, yeah. that when you read, because I have little kids and when you read stories to them, you often do, you'll read them story and then you'll be like, but maybe that's not right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not. So I thought that that was such a neat idea to think about the personality of the voice, which is definitely something um, that, uh, that, you know, when we're doing re reportage that we could think about more um, and that we think about so much in fiction. And this actually... Um, his question about the market shortcuts to a question I was going to ask you all later on, but I want to ask it now because it fits. Um, you know, there, yeah, we do, I think, writers experience that pressure from the publishers to find kind of the cow path to market, you know, so the smooth place, um, which is a, a necessary evil simply to find readers, right? In the capitalist market, that's how you find readers is by selling your work. Um, and you're both kind of, I think, iconoclastic in a way. And I was wondering if you have advice for other writers who maybe feel a little bit of despair about having to position their work one way or another, simply so that readers can find it um, in a library or bookstore, because there definitely is, I think, uh, a dampening to the kind of artistic experimentation that writers want to do while also knowing, well, I need to write this in a way that people can find it. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the only thing I, I'll say about it is that you, like publishers can label the book any way they want. Readers will read it the way they want. Um, I, I'm always surprised at my, my, my second book, Brown, um, was also a book of heavy reportage, actually from more countries than, and more destinations than return. And yet it always got described as memoir. Uh, or a very personal quest, mm -hmm. um, and uh, or the or the parts in it that resonated with certain readers are uh, the, the the parts in the beginning where I start again as I do with Return. I I, I start with the personal. Um, so I, I, I don't I don't I don't I don't want to sound skeptic, but I can I give up. Like okay, I'm gonna write the book I want. I'm gonna leave it to the marketing uh, department and the editors to to push it in any way they feel, um, you know, as you said, in the, in the capitalist market. But ultimately, readers take from it what they want, and you can't. I don't. I don't think. You, I mean, I, I don't think you can control that experience at all. Mm -hmm. It's like a philosophy of non-attachment. <laughs> I do sometimes push back against um, a book like Return being called a memoir. However, yeah. I would push back against that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If they if they had was there a discussion of calling Return a memoir? I don't think so. No, no. I don't. I don't. Think, but but you know, it is it is far more uh, steeped in a personal experience than the the previous book. So yeah. okay. I can see why uh, it. And, and when you read the dust jacket uh, copy, you might get the impression that it is also a memoir with reporting. Mm -hmm. Well, for, in my case, um, the, the genre more often than not, the question of genre has been used to um, to reject the book rather than situate the book by publishers. So, oh. so um, you know the big publishers, the 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 Harper Collins, the Random House, the mm -hmm. the Knopfs. Um, they just say, "Well, it's short stories. We're not interested, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right?" Um, and, and if you bring up Alice Monroe, which everyone always does, they say, well, when you publish every story in the New Yorker, sure, come back to us and we'll, we'll publish your book of stories. That's actually literally a quote that yeah. I heard from an editor. Okay. Okay. So, 
so for me, it's never been really a question of, um, it, it's, it's, it's been really like a question of survival. Um, <laughs> do I continue to do this work in this genre that I love and that <laughs> I feel, and that I feel compelled to write, or do I try and artificially sort of, um, force myself into, into a genre I'm not comfortable with in order to satisfy the marketing demands mm -hmm. of, uh, of a publisher mm -hmm. and, and, and that's your own subsistence demands too, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm lucky. I'm very lucky because I'm a professor, so I'm, I'm okay. Um, mm -hmm. I don't need to worry about, uh, my books making money, thank God. Um, but, um, but for me, you know, I, 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 I did publish with a big publishing house once and, and mm -hmm. they were very insistent that the next book had to be a novel. And I spent mm -hmm. two years trying to write it, mm -hmm. uh, not wanting to. And mm -hmm. of course it, it was garbage <laughs> because you don't <laughs> want to write it. So why would anyone want to read yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and I, finally I just said, look, I, I'm out of here. Um, I'm, I'll go back to publishing with smaller presses uh, because this is the work I really want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it's, it's just been a question of, of, of making that sacrifice mm -hmm. and, and of, or, or just making that decision. It's not really a sacrifice because I love to do it. So it, mm -hmm. it's not that, but just making the decision. Well, you, you have to walk away from that and mm -hmm. you have to, you have to just work, do the work you, you feel okay. you, that's important and vital. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's that's been my experience mm -hmm. and in terms of genre I, I do mix my own genres and and borrow from other genres but the pieces end up short and they end up as 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 fiction um and so there you go short fiction mm -hmm. um yeah. but uh whether they correspond to anything exactly is probably um um it's probably not as exact so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I think what you're saying actually makes me think of what Kamal said at the beginning of this conversation, that there, there is a book that's in you and it's the book that wants to be written. And in some ways, there's no negotiating around that, which is, um, I guess, why definitely my dad didn't want me to become an artist. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what your dad's thought. So, but yeah. yeah spare actually, time. Do it in your spare time. <laughs> yeah, that was what my dad said. Yeah. 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 Um, Okay, so uh, one of the things that uh, we all have in common is that we all write about migration and diaspora. For me, uh, it's a topic I never seem to be able to get away from. Uh, but lately, I've been trying to better understand how my identity as an immigrant Canadian interacts with my identity as a settler. Um, I've put great thought into one and truly not enough thought into the other. Um, so in return, uh, for example, there is a link between the stories of Indigenous communities here and your driving investigation, Kamal, um, into mm -hmm. questions of lost lands and borders and exile. Mm -hmm. And in Ghost Geographies, the characters who flee to Canada um, become settlers on Indigenous land. And there's obviously such complexity to how those seeking refuge in Canada wind up having to participate in the occupation of someone else's land. Um, but it's clear that neither the stories nor presence of Indigenous people in Canada wound up being the right fit for either of your projects because they didn't make it into the final draft we have before us. And I was wondering if you could speak about why writing about Indigenous people in the Canadian context didn't really seem like the right fit, even though there are um, some thematic overlaps there. And I really ask this question because I myself am trying trying to conceive of how my settler identity affects what I wind up including in my stories. And I was wondering if you have insight into how it affects your own. Gosh, <clears throat> well, I, I, I think for me, I have written about that issue um, elsewhere in, in, in a SIF magazine mm -hmm. form <clears throat> and other forms of writing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think in, 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 the, in this particular book, um, I had hoped to include a chapter on um, on uh, sort of uh, urban native people mm -hmm. who choose to return mm -hmm. um, to the land or the reserves or to their to uh, indigenous com uh, to the mm -hmm. communities. Um, unfortunately, COVID happened, and there were mm -hmm. a number of um, uh, like I just you couldn't go and visit yeah. uh, um, a community and and. Um, and I, but I'd also be lying if I said I I wasn't um, I wasn't comfortable um, taking on the, the, that narrative mm -hmm. um, because of the of the on some level the appropriation the fear of being appropriated yeah. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. appropriating that story I think there's mm -hmm. uh, there's a legitimate concern about uh, non-indigenous people kind of taking up space or taking up uh, indigenous uh, narrative uh, narratives um, and and in general I felt that I, I, I 
I think that the focus of the book is on borders and international borders. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think I, I just sort of, I wanted to see how movement between countries and between borders and continents and across oceans um, um, uh, overlap. And I would, for example, I would have loved to include move, uh, the people who return to the small communities uh, after moving to the big city. And I hint at it in terms of some, uh, particularly um, the gay community returning, um, le leaving the city that, like in, like in my case, Toronto as a gay man is like, the, the, like my savior and my, my, my mm -hmm. safe space. Um, and, um, and I've noticed that a lot of my friends are just, you know, that the city is not what it you know what it was promoted to us uh, so I did but because that happens within the borders I didn't really focus on that as much mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and, and I would say that the, the same is uh, probably true for me Kamal mm -hmm. that there's a, a certain amount of fear and anxiety um, about making a mistake yeah what about you Tomash yeah I I, I, I um, I'm dealing with characters who are profoundly unsettled in Canada. Mm -hmm. They do not feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. They do not feel as though this country is theirs. Mm -hmm. I, have an, I have a story in an earlier collection uh, called The Inert Landscapes of Dirge Ferenc, where um, I'm dealing with a character there who doesn't even recognize Canadian culture as a culture. Hmm. That is to say, he's a completely Eurocentric narcissist Mm -hmm. who feels that Canada is this blank slate mm -hmm. um, um, that it's a that it's a kind of vo cultural void that mm -hmm. nothing has happened in there mm -hmm. and that the only culture that matters is the culture that he has brought with him in his mm -hmm. memories and personal history mm -hmm. so I'm trying to get at that aspect of it negatively mm -hmm. in the sense of of this kind of eurocentric point of view that mm -hmm. refuses to acknowledge anything behind it and embedding the critique of that in a, in a way within its own within its own paradigm mm -hmm. um, rather than um, bringing you know bringing in the external sort of aspect to that um, and so these characters uh, become kind of spiritually starved in Canada yeah. they, they fall apart they they the void becomes them because of their refusal to acknowledge the history and the and the political reality mm -hmm. of where they are. So yeah. that's that's been my approach yeah. Yeah. to that. Um, mm -hmm. And and it's an that's an imperfect answer to your question. Um, but that's uh, that's kind of how I've been approaching it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have I have tried I have tried wants to write a story that directly addresses um, your question, um, but it it failed. It was a failure, yeah. and yeah. I, I yeah. never I never sent it out because yeah. I just felt that it was too um, it was too small a window on the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly appreciate what you're saying about how I think that's that's very insightful and makes so much sense about how. The experience of cultural dislocation and the desperation of being away uh, from your home culture might uh, paradoxically be a way of contributing to the project of Canadian colonization. I, I actually think I've seen that in my own family, um, actually, and it sort of does wind up explaining some of the gaps. And when I ask, I'm a second generation immigrant. When I asked my parents about sort of what they came, what they thought, they actually did not have curiosity. I think about Canadian history because of that kind of supremacy about their about their home culture. Um, and I think something, and and um, I don't think you should apologize for having an imperfect answer. I think uh, it's something that uh, as as writers who are settlers, we need to talk about, but is an uncomfortable thing to talk about. So I appreciate you both engaging with the question. Um, but something that I think about a lot is actually how to more overtly paint what it means to be a settler in my work. So that's something that I've been thinking about and what you're saying, I think, does speak to that. So I appreciate that. Um, so we have a few more minutes, I think, before we open it up uh, to uh, the floor. So I have a few more questions to ask you, but um, if anyone who's listening in wants to ask a question, um, I think you can drop that in, in the chat. Um, there are so a lot of comments. I see, yeah. I don't see. Do you see a question? Okay. The, I think word on the street will let us know. <laughs> okay. um, 
So I thought the decision to, to pair your books for this event uh, is very clever because uh, I think they're similar while not appearing, obviously so, from that dratted publishing copy. Um, and I think what makes them similar is how they're both driven by nostalgia. Uh, Kamal, mm -hmm. you wind up looking at uh, the concrete manifestation of nostalgia, which is return, and its enormous political and economic consequences, which I thought was so fascinating because we think of nostalgia as being abstract or something spiritual, mm -hmm. but your book talks about the actual um, you know, the material uh, ramifications of it. Mm -hmm. um, and ghost geography is similarly a wash in nostalgia. Uh, it's treated so differently uh, in every story. Sometimes nostalgia is a joke, sometimes it's a poison. Um, sometimes it's a longing for something that never happened, which is a kind of utopia. And I was wondering if you could talk about the role of nostalgia in the making of your books, how it organizes the stories you tell, inspires them, or even maybe stalls them. Mm -hmm. Well, too much you want to go first? <laughs> uh, <laughs> When sure. it was a difficult, difficult question, I just <laughs> end it all. Yeah, like, That's uh, why we do it together. <laughs> it's, it's it's me sometime. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I've noticed lately a, a kind of like nostalgia just getting a bad rap. I don't know if, if if you've noticed this. I was on a I was on a website that I go to quite frequently, a music website called Pitchfork, which <laughs> is which is a kind of review site. And I've noticed a number of times on that website, they're reviewing albums and they're saying, uh, oh, this is this, you know, the, the great failing of this album is it's nostalgia. And I think I think it's probably arising from a feeling right now that, you know, we're we're falling apart. We've mm -hmm. got the we've got the rise of populism, the things Kamal has been talking about in terms of hate crimes um, uh, across the spectrum, not both racially motivated, both in terms of gender, sexuality. Um, the environment is about to go ballistic. Um, we don't have time for nostalgia. Now is not mm. the time for sitting back and sipping a mint julep and reflecting on the good old days. Mm. It's now time to get to work and, and, and start addressing these problems. So, um, so I am very, that's been my awareness is like, what you know? How does nostalgia function to paralyze? How does it function to as an escape? Mm -hmm. um, how does it function as a as a kind of uh, tranquilizer or sedative? Mm -hmm. um, and and then at the same time, can it be a tool to uncover something that maybe we missed along the way and that could be helpful right now? Mm -hmm. So that's that's been sort of my approach to exploring mm -hmm. that idea. Mm -hmm. um, and and so both as malaise and as remedy, I don't ever tend to stick to any one perspective on anything. Mm -hmm. I like to explore the varieties of it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's been that's been my uses of it. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're talking about is nostalgia as an animator. So not well, so nostalgia, I guess that's something that creates a chain of action. So it's it's. Uh, more probing than just saying like nostalgia is a turning away from the world because it is but then it what then what are the consequences so i think that right. that's very interesting um and, and for me like i i was i didn't actually know that nostalgia as a term it, it's actually is a is a medical term that comes from oh. um from uh, uh in the seventh i believe in the 17th century uh, from soldiers who missed their home so much mm -hmm. They, the prescription for them was to return home. So Nost and Algeria, uh, mm -hmm. from so two different routes to that word, mm -hmm. to that word. But I, I would, I would agree with Tamash here that, uh, except I will come at it from a different point of view, is that nostalgia has also been uh, weaponized and used as a way to kind of create. Uh, I mean, the, the Make America Great Again is mm -hmm. a kind of a nostalgia mm -hmm. that has been used by, um, by populist governments, mm -hmm. um, and it is an imagined history that was mostly white where racialized mm -hmm. people and immigrants didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I- Nostalgia I, for, a, for a past that never occurred. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And, mm -hmm. and in, many, in, in many ways, I, what, what I found like as a common thread in the book is how nations play on that nostalgia. 
um, sometimes been, you know, uh, sort of benignly, as, as in, in the Irish nostalgia for, you know, Ireland to, to draw people back and invest, uh, and invest, uh, and it's sometimes very commercially, as there's a whole chapter set in Ghana where there's like a return to Africa, return to your an ancestor ho mm -hmm. ancestral homeland. Um, and it is, it is sometimes used as a, as a sort of an exercise in nation building. Um, so uh, while, and sometimes it's just, it's, like I can sometimes uh, separate nostalgia from romanticism. Like mm -hmm. sometimes it's a highly romanticized view. I'm nostalgic to a place I left it when I was three years old and I only know through the memories of my parents and siblings. Um, this is fiction, this is pure fiction. I don't know what I'm nostalgic for exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I try in this book sort of kind of explore why sometimes return is a fantasy and why there's validity in a fantasy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess what we're seeing is the fact that nostalgia is so steeped uh, in fantasy and fiction is probably why it made it into both of your works, which mm -hmm. would deal with the boundaries between fiction and nonfiction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have an audience question. Uh, this is a great question from Yelly who asks, has writing and existing from home in the couple of years of the pandemic complicated or expanded on any of your ideas about home and your writing? Oh, this one I can go first because it's an easy one for me. I, <laughs> I, I, I just, I, I did not realize how much it doesn't matter where you are um, anymore on, on mm -hmm. some level. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think I would have moved to Vancouver if it, if it weren't for the pandemic. Like before the pandemic, I would have said, leave Toronto, are you crazy? This is the center of the universe. I would never leave, but, but what the-, what the <laughs> Don't say that to anybody there. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't try to protect well, you. <laughs> only, only, only everyone watching this event live. Um, um, uh, but it just, in a way, a sense of place, um, um, like it, it sort of, it destabilized my sense of place a little bit that it, mm -hmm. ultimately it is, um, you can go somewhere else or you can move or a sense of place probably doesn't matter as much. Um, I mean, I had other reasons I wanted to leave to, uh, Toronto, but, 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 but that what the pandemic has, um, has upended my very firmly placed uh, roots um, in Toronto. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think um, a lot of people who are transnationals and people who live in several places at once have that experience, like people who sort of exist on WhatsApp or who mm -hmm. are often FaceTiming with people in other countries. And it's interesting how actually that experience has now become something that everyone has mm -hmm. uh, in the pandemic, because now we communicate so much through the screen. And it, yeah, it does definitely destabilize the notion of where we are. Mm -hmm. I um, My experience has been a little bit... Um, like uh, it's reminded me of uh, Thoreau and Walden, which I a text I don't think I ever really fully understood. But I think when you're stuck at home and stuck within a sort of 12 block radius uh, where you go for a walk every day because there's you can't do anything else, you start to become incredibly alert and alive to what's around you um, mm. in a way that you weren't before. Mm -hmm. I live in a kind of downtown sort of suburban place. And uh, and it, it feels like a transitional neighborhood to me, and it doesn't anymore because of the pandemic. It has, it's no longer a place I, I leave to go live somewhere else and then come back to eat and sleep. Uh, it it feels more full to me. It feels more um, rich, richer in detail and richer in in um, in experience. So it has had that interesting effect of kind of en enlivening me in a way um and it's also been fantastic for for and from an environmental perspective i walk mm -hmm. everywhere i ride my bike <laughs> everywhere i'm almost never in a car mm -hmm. uh so in some way um I, I sometimes wonder if this isn't some sort of like spirit of the planet going okay you guys aren't going to slow down i'm going to slow you down mm -hmm. i'm going to create a pandemic i'm going to mm -hmm. send it out and you're going to stop emitting all this carbon for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, optimistically, you, tr you kind of come up with these sort of um, metaphysical <laughs> sort of ideas. But, um, but uh, it, 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 uh, it soothes me to think mm -hmm. that. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find it soothing to listen to you talk about how um, being slowed down made you see things in your neighborhood that you didn't before. It sounds like a more profound version of me realizing all the things that were in my fridge. 
plus <laughs> right, that I didn't yeah. pay. And I was like, oh, look at all the things I can make. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah there's, yeah, there's definitely positive. I also effects. have done a lot more work around the house in the last two years than in the last <laughs> 10. So. Um, okay. Um, so I'm just checking to see if we have, I don't see another audience question. So I want to ask you a question that I love um, to ask writers when I talk to them, which is simply, uh, what music did you listen to or what TV did you watch while you were writing these books? If you watch TV, maybe you're not TV. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to stick on the nostalgia theme here mm -hmm. um, because I, I, I found that when I, whenever I write something that is... Um, that is more difficult emotionally. I, I resort to comfort food and comfort television. Oh, um, yeah. So, so I'm I'm a big fan of the Golden Girls and Frasier, like the, the, the classic <laughs> the um, sitcoms TV. of the eighties and nineties. Yeah. Um, and and I I started buying them on DVD and oh, just and like secondhand from um, uh, from BMV, which is a great store, um, and um, and just I, I'm devouring things that made me. Uh, comfortable and and it's the same for music. I mean, I can't. I'm one of those really people who can only work at home in a quiet space. Mm -hmm. um, so aside from you know sort of some classical music, occasionally I don't actually play music um, when I unless it is a kind of background. But really, I, ca I can't think. I can't listen to music and and write sometimes at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. Um, I love that idea, though, of you creating this very complete kind of comfort experience by actually watching the DVDs instead of streaming. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. no. Like okay. yeah. DVDs. So I can, I, I can, I can I also, I just, just love watching on a big screen. Yeah. Um, and, and there's something so comforting about watching what you already know, and there will be no plot twists and no surprises. There's no, and, and if it's an episode that I like, find that makes me icky, I skip it. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I want the ones that make me happy right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hate to be a corporate shill, but I feel like it's kind of maybe like going to McDonald's when you're in a new place. You're like, well, I know exactly what I'm going to get, and there's comfort there. So, yeah, I think that's the cornerstone of their. Uh, take over of the world. Go <laughs> 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 yeah. um, ahead, Tomas. Uh, yeah, I, um, I do actually listen to music always when I write. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, but it is usually uh, instrumental music, whether mm -hmm. it's classical or jazz. I can't listen to anything that has a lyrical aspect mm -hmm. yeah. to it mm -hmm. yeah. um, because the words <laughs> get confused with my own. Oh, fair enough. That's Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Was there anything that you listened to in the time, for, like, both of you can answer this quote, in the time of writing, maybe not while you were actually writing, that maybe sort of the atmosphere of slipped into the books? Well, I, uh, I, uh, I know that during the pandemic, what I would do is I would just go to certain record labels like Naxos hmm. or ECM or... Mm -hmm. um, there's one called 2020, I think. And I would just, I would just find the catalog and I would just go through the albums going, Oh, that looks interesting. And then I would just stream it. And so I was doing this kind of exploration of, of, of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I watch a ton of TV every, oh. almost every night. Um, and I will watch everything from, from, you know, old Seinfeld reruns to, um, I watched an amazing miniseries called Foss, Fossey Verdun. Have you seen that? Oh, it's oh, got, that's right. Fossey and Gwen, yeah. Gwen Verdun. Yeah. It yeah. was an amazing, especially the acting was phenomenal uh, during the pandemic. That was a highlight. One of my uh, sons is a budding filmmaker. And so he has is, is taking us back through the Criterion oh, wow. collection. <laughs> And I'm watching all the things that I watched when I was in my 20s. So we're watching Bergman and Fellini and we're watching Truffaut oh. and we're watching Varda. And we're so it, that's been amazing because yeah. suddenly I'm like, oh, I'm, I, 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 you know, I, I barely remember this. I mean, I remember oh. the feeling of watching these and the feeling they gave me, but I don't actually remember the details. So it's been great. He's kind of reawakened me to to all that sort of classic art, art house cinema. So that's mm -hmm. been really and it's mm -hmm. part of it is just watching him watch it for the first time yeah. has been yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. 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 That's wonderful. Um, thank you so much, uh, Kamal and Tomash. Um, this brings us to the end of our discussion. Um, and I had a wonderful time.
Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I really much. appreciate it. And yeah. thank yeah. you for working on the Great streets question. and diaspora dialogues as well. I really Definitely. appreciate Definitely. Huge thanks to all of you for sitting and having this conversation. I've just been learning so many things, hiding behind the wings, listening to you brilliant people speak. And Thea, thank you so much for facilitating the conversation. And thank you to everyone who has been tuning in this wonderful, sunny Saturday morning from home. If you'd like to purchase a copy of Return, Why We Go Back to Where We Come From by Kamal al -Salele and Ghost Geographies, Fictions by Tamash Dabozi, please visit our official bookseller for this event, which is Another Story Bookshop, or our official ebook and audiobook sponsor, Rakuten Kobo. You have nine more days to sign up for our giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. Visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca slash 2021-festival-contest for your chance to win one of three special prizes, including a new Kobo e-reader. Remember, for each day of the festival that you tune in, we'll be announcing one bonus entry code. Today's bonus entry code is ILLUSTRATE. Make sure to tune in later today for our next panel, Illustrating Identity, Visual Language and Queer Stories at 1 p.m. with Jem Hall, Selena Golding, Shira Spector, and Sami Alwani. For more information about this year's lineup, as well as the panelists you've heard today, visit our website at toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you'd like to support The Word on the Street by making a donation, simply head to our website and click Donate Now at the top of the homepage. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great day.